coming from hell. Amen. The funky songs, the, the, the music that we have originated from hell. Satan, the devil. He was in heaven. He was a music leader in heaven. He led the songs. In the book of Micah, it says that when he sings, this power comes out of his voice. But the problem is he had so much pride that God kicked him out of heaven. That's why he's roaming around the world. He came down with one third of angels. That's why they turn into demons now. He's the devil and they're the demons. One third. So they know how to sing. And that's why he's taking the glory of God to the nightclubs and the pops. And the bands are playing for his glory, not God's glory. The church has to arise and get the level of the band and the music above the world music. Right. So if you're here today and you're thinking, wow, there's rapping in the church. Amen. I thought I could only get the rapping from uh, from uh, from the nightclubs or the world. Am I too loud? Yeah. Is it a bit too loud? Right. Do you jump in? Hallelujah. You know, yesterday, you know, out me to Emmerdale, there wasn't so many people around. Well, I have the report here that we have four songs for the kingdom yesterday. Give a clap up before the Lord. Praise God. These are the people that Sister Susanna was sharing to while they stopped by and have a look, have a listen. And the conviction of the Holy Spirit got them. I even got their names and their last names here. So we had four songs for the kingdom yesterday. And some people were encouraged, like that young Indian man. Is he here today? The Indian man that I prayed for yesterday. Of course, he's flying again. <laughs> Hallelujah. So you see, you plant the seed, you go out there in the rain. We were watching the uh, the, the video that Russell uh, Foley uh, uh, filmed yesterday at Pastor's house. And we were amazed how it was singing and the wind was blowing and the rain. Mm. It's like yeah. we're on a ship and you do the outreach from the ship. Amazing. Rain your sunshine, you serve the Lord with all your hearts. Doesn't matter. Greetings to you in the name of Jesus Christ today. From our uh, People for Christ Church in Canberra, Australia. Also I have with me uh, Russell Foley and uh, Peter Lee, the uh, very committed members of People for Christ. Gentlemen, can you uh, stand up please and face the church and say hello to them. Say good day, mate. Yeah. These are the young men. We call them the young fellows on the mountain because they climb the mountain every Saturday morning at 7, 7.30 to pray. This is all year round. The whole year we're up there in Mount Easley overlooking the city of Canberra and we pray for ourselves, our families, churches, not just us, unselfishness. We pray for the government of Australia. The Parliament House fits us on the mountain, so we always pray for that Parliament House for Julia Gillard to give her lives to Christ. Because <laughs> she's uh, an, an atheist, she doesn't believe in God. And uh, we're praying hard for her. She either received God or God will kick her out of Parliament. And uh, she will lose her job and find somebody righteous to lead the nation. Amen? And that is our prayers with Russell and Peter and the other people on the mountain for the parliament and the leadership of Australia. I think you said why are you right? I think you said no. Praise God. Although I said to Julia Gillard last year when I shook her hand in a parliament house that God loves you and there's a God up there. If you acknowledge him, your leadership as a prime minister of Australia will go a long way. And you know, as you turn to me going, Oh, thank you, Pastor. Very nice and soft woman. So we've done that. We've sent a message to her. It's up to her. But today is not about Julia Gillard. It's about God. Yes. Amen. Amen. Yes. And it's about you. <coughs> in, in where you are in the Lord. 
Give me one second. I'll use this one. Thank you, Lord. <coughs> Today it's about where you are with God. <coughs> it's very important for you to wake up, not only as a Christian, as a church goer, but to very be very careful in how you live your life. You see, the message that we come across the Testament to give you as from uh, Wednesday night, you must be real before God. Notice the word must. I mean, you have no choice. You must be real before God. I tell you what, the Bible says that heaven and earth will disappear. This place will disappear. New Zealand will disappear. Australia. Even heavens will disappear. But he said the word of God remains. This word. So you can strive for a better thing in this life. The materialistic things in life. But they won't last longer. <coughs> Even you and me will not last longer in this life. One day we'll die. Who knows? Today, tomorrow, next month. But do you know where you're going? Do you know your destiny? Are you sure you're going to make it to heaven? Amen? Amen? You must be real before God. Like Wednesday night. A few things that he reminded you and me of how we live before God. And the question is, why do we have to be real before God? Because He's real. He's alive. We're not worshipping and wasting our time today, dancing and clapping and praise God to a dead God. No, He's alive. Amen. Amen. That's why we felt that presence right in the beginning. He's alive. So he, if he's real, you ought to be real. I ought to be real. If you can't be real for God, you, you won't make the connection. You can't connect it to God if you're unreal. You must be real in order for you to make that connection to the real God. In order for you to feel and experience the reality of God in your life and my life. You started to feel that there is a, a miracle that God's created in my life now. How you get that when you are real before God, church. You can attend the church, you can come every Sunday, but you can still be far away from God. Right. And you're still worshipping your little gods at home. Maybe your job becomes a god to you. Maybe your car becomes the god to you. You love the car more than God. Or even you love one another before God. More than God. Today I'm going to show you how to be real before God through the scripture. That scripture will show you four things that God's going to command you and lead you to do it in order to reconcile again with God and to be real before God. We're not talking about born again Christians here or give your life to Christ. We're talking about how you connected to God again. Find your ways in this life and then find your way in a life eternity. You see, when, when King Solomon finished building a temple for God, then he dedicated the, the temple to God. He thought it was a good thing to do, was directed by God. At the completion of the, of the temple, he dedicated the temple, and all of a sudden God said something to him that shocked him. Turn your Bibles to Second Chronicles. Please. Second Chronicle chapter 7. Solomon had the shock of his life when God 
show him the reality of the things between him and God. The things between the Israelites people and God. He was so happy the temple's already been dedicated, done, completed. And God said something to him. I want you to know that he will see the same, same thing to you and me today. You must be real before God. Second Chronicle chapter 7 verse 14. But we're looking at uh, verse 13. We're looking at verse 12 now. Well, I'll read it from 11. It says, The Lord's response to Solomon. So Solomon finished the temple of the Lord as well as the royal palace. He completed everything he had planned it to do in the construction of the temple and the palace. Verse 12. Then one night the Lord appeared to Solomon and said, If you have a sound of Bible or the Lord of Ali, you too. Second Chronicle chapter 7. I'm reading starting from 11. One night the Lord appeared to Solomon and said, in verse 12, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this temple as the place for making sacrifices. 13. At times I might shut up the heavens so that no rain falls or command the cross hoppers to devour your crops or send the plagues among you. Listen, in the temple, we pray like Solomon. He said, I've heard your prayer. He said, I've heard your prayer and have chosen this temple as a place for making sacrifices. Not this place. We here to praise God, we ask you to come and He came. And we give the sacrifice of praises today. We don't have any animals here to offer to God. We offer ourselves as living sacrifices. We offer our praises. We bow down and kneel down and honor Him. But God knows something else that Solomon don't know. And he sarcastically said it on verse 13. Everything's been planted. And then when it comes to it, at times I might shut up the heavens so that no rain falls. You notice you can come to church, as I said, like Solomon. And honor God in everything He does. But God said, sometimes I might shut the heavens so there's no rain coming down. I will cause the cross hoppers to devour your crops. You ever been in a situation you work, 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 and you can't save any money? You know what's devouring your money? Bills to pay. The lust of shopping. You spend more money on that, the bills pay. Before you know it, you've got no money to spare. That's what you call devour. It's an evil spirit that comes and takes your wealth away. Take your money away from you. Like you said here, I'll shut heaven. Yet you're still in the church. Yet you're still praying. But God has closed up heaven. There's no blessings. 
Rain means blessing from heaven. So if he shut up heaven, he said, I'll stop the rain. That means he's stopping the showers of blessings to your life. In other words, you're wasting your time working. Try to develop the family. And you're still poor. You still say, I can't afford it. I can't afford it. There's a devout spirit allowed by God. So he said it to Solomon. Then in verse 14, he explained why that happens. And in verse 14, there are four things that we need to do to open up heaven again. To get the favor of God in our lives. He said, Then if my people who are called by my name, first thing, will humble. Notice the word, my people. For if my people who are called by my name, He's not talking about the rest of Auckland. He's not talking about the rest of New Zealand. He's talking about you that believes in God. He's talking about you that has given your life to God. That you are a son. That you are a daughter of God. Called by the name of Jesus. Why are you missing out then? How come you don't get the blessings then? First, too much pride. Amen? You live with so much pride that God said, number one, humble yourself. My people that call by my name will humble. God said, I walk with the humble. I resist the pride. I fend off the pride person. Whether you're a pastor, you're an elder, deacon, a church member, but if you're full of pride, guess what? God is spending you every day of your life. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, you can pray. You can build a temple like Solomon. You think you're doing a good thing for God, but if you have pride, he said, humble. Because I'm blocking heaven. I've closed heaven above you. I've allowed the cross harbor to destroy your, your crops. Whatever you try to grow, they don't grow. A cross harbor allowed by God to destroy you. You have no harvest. Nothing to eat. Not enough money. He said, and I will allow the devourer. The devourer is a demon go devourer that takes away your wealth. I'll allow the devourer to come and destroy you. So what is he asking for? This is the formula to be real before God again. Having pride, you're unreal. He said, I fend off the pride, I give grace to the humble. That's the first one. The second one to be real before God, he said, pray. This is not praying for needs. This is a prayer of repentancy. You pray, talk to God that I'm sorry. First, you humble. Second, you tell God, apologize to him, I'm sorry. That's what that prayer is saying. If my people are humble and pray, and you're not praying, give me a four wheel drive. I want some KFC every day. I want a better job. That's not the person. He's talking about you talking to him. I'm sorry. I repent of my sin. I humble myself. I'm sorry, Lord, for what I've done. I haven't been real before you in my life. My family. The second step is to tell God, pray. The fourth one. First, humble. Second, pray. Third, seek my face. 
How do you seek the face of God? When you have your time to devote and you worship Him and glorify Him, so you go before God at all times. Humble. Number two, pray. Number three, seek the face of God. Amen? Are you alright? Humble, pray, seek. The formula to get back to God, to be real before God. The last one is to turn away from your wicked ways. That's the fourth one. He said, humble, if my people are called by my name, will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn away from their wicked ways. You're sitting here today, you're still doing wicked things. Evil things. You have to turn around from it. Turn away. How to restore before God is to go through those four steps. Humble, pray for repentancy, apologize to God. Third, seek the face of God. Fourth, turn away from the wicked ways. Some of you would think, what, what's the wicked ways? The evil ways that you're doing. Try to eat the wicked wings from KFC. They're hot and spicy. Amen? Unless you like hot stuff and spicy stuff, you like the wicked wings, but I don't like the name of it. I pray and deliver people from evil. If you eat the wicked wings, <laughs> it's an open door to wickedness. Amen? Amen? Try to be a Christian and jump into a non-Christian car. Listen to the lyrics up there on the songs and the songs. Punch you in the face. You eat them. <laughs> and swear and swear. You come out there started swearing and feel like a punch in the face. You influence by what you hear. That's what God said. Tell them to turn away from the wicked ways. The formula is humble, pray, seek the face of God, and turn away from your wicked ways. You gotta make it to heaven somewhere, somehow, someday. You can say, I've got plenty of time to live. Do you own your life? I don't think so. He does. You and me have no idea how long we're going to live this life. Only Him. And that's why the awareness that you've got to be careful how you live your life before God. Your friends will go away. Your family will go away. If you die, you stand alone before God. Oh, where's my father? He's not here. Where's my pastor? He's not here. Just you. A couple of months ago, we had a series in Australia that I was talking about, don't be kicked out by Jesus when you die. You stand there and you think, oh yeah, I went to be before Christ Church. I always go there. I see me in a worship team. I play the instrument. Or I do the mix of life after that. You turn away from your wicked ways. <laughs> Doesn't look like <laughs> Just kidding, bro. <laughs> You stand there and Jesus said, go away. I don't know you. The scripture says. And Jesus, your name. The people who call my name said, I don't know you. Get out. And guess what? He said, go to where the fire is. Too late. You can walk out of here today and think, oh, I've got another day. I'll, I'll think about it. You never know when you're going away from this life. You never know when Jesus comes back. You know, we never know when the world is finished. You humble yourself today. You pray for repentance before God. You seek the face of God. And you turn around. Or turn away from your evil ways. If you have evil ways in your life. 
Even you young people, you know, I, I can understand, you teenagers, you want to enjoy life and go for it. But I want to warn you, you go for it with God. Enjoy life with God in your life. That's the balance. Even marriage couple, even us, the old folks, we have to make sure that we are in Christ all the time or we miss out on heaven. In the last thing of the sermon today, if you, if you look at it, this is what's going to happen. If you humble yourself, if you praise His God, I'm sorry. If you seek His face, how do you seek the face of God? Read the Bible, pray, act the morning, listen to the Word, and practice and live it. This is what's going to happen to you. He said, three things will happen. Seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. First thing he's going to do, I will hear from heaven. You do those four things, God will hear you. God will hear your cry, your prayers. God, please help me on this. I need a new job or I need a car or whatever. He said, I will hear you from heaven. Imagine trying to pray to God for so many things we need and He doesn't hear you. Or me. We go through the four steps. He starts the first step. I will hear from heaven. Like our prayer warriors on Tuesday. Like we said to the man on Tuesday last week. It's pointless. It's a waste of time to come to the prayer meeting and God don't hear you. Because of your lifestyle. Because of the evil ways you're doing. You might as well stay home. God will hear from heaven. Amen. Second. He said, I will forgive your sins. He'll hear you. Then he'll forgive you. I will forgive your sins. Do you understand being forgiven by God is the best thing that ever happened to you and me? Because being forgiven by God is the curse being lifted out of your life. Because the wrath of God has been upon you and a curse has been upon you. You don't get that much or many things in your life. He shut up heaven like he said to Solomon. You allow the cross papa to come and destroy your corpse. You allow the devout spirit to come and take away your wealth. The moment he hears you. The moment he forgives you. Curses lift out of you. You're set free. The first thing you get, you've been free from all those curses. You've been free from the cross hoppers. You've been free from the devout spirit. His God heard you. From now on, He's forgiven you. And you are set free. Third thing that will happen. Not only you hear you, He forgives you. And He said, I will heal their land. Does that mean the land was sick? Of course. You can try to grow so many things in the land, but nothing grows because it's sick. It is healing. You know, he didn't say, I will heal their bodies. Why did he say land? If he's going to forgive us, he should heal us. Human bodies. But he went straight to the provision. He said, I will heal the land. Land means the provision of your life. Where you get your food from. Where the river flows, where you get your drink from. The land. The land was cursed. The land was sick. He said, I will heal their land. You know, when the land is healed, everything grow and blossom. Because God has healed your land. 
I was speaking in a conference in June up in Sydney. These guys came with us for a seven day conference. Every night preaching. Every night. And the theme of the crusade, the pastor said, Pastor Betty, we're talking about asking God to heal the land of Australia. That's the theme of the crusade. To heal the land. We had a few speakers in between to give me a break. And they talked about the land of Australia. We need to heal the land of Australia. To heal the land of Australia. And God gave me a different message all those nights. It wasn't about the land first. It was about the people's life. Before God. Then the land will heal. Amen. Amen. They're jumping the gun. These guys know. They prayed for the Australian man to be healed. We pour oil. Russell pour oil on the mountain to heal the land. Nothing wrong with it. But you see, the land was sick because of mankind. Amen. The land was cursed because of people. Because of our sins. So we can blab on about healing the land of Auckland, healing the land of New Zealand, you need to heal yourself first. You need to get right with God first before that happens. That's what God says to God said you need to humble, pray, seek my face, and turn away from your wicked ways. Then I will heal you from heaven. You know, you can live here, you can go to work every morning, you suffer from finances. So many bills to pay. Gets here. What is it? Pay coat here. Pay coat there. You know why? Because you haven't humbled yourself. You haven't prayed a repenting prayer. You haven't seen the face of God. And you haven't turned around from your wicked ways. What do you think why God said, Patty, go to open it and tell them they must be real before me. I also you're wasting your time. So the final night of the crusade, there's an Aboriginal pastor there. Everybody talk about healing the land. Even Peter and Russell and the other Australian Malangis in the, in the crusade have to come up in the front with the Aboriginal people here with their pastor and have to, these guys were meant to apologize to them. Of what the white men did to them. They, they shoot them, they kill them, they bully them around and all that stuff. And the Aboriginal people are still angry about them. But these guys representing the forefathers and apologize to them and come and hold hands together and try to reconcile so the land can be healed on Australia. And I come up in the world and they say it's not about the land, it's about you. You need to repent before God. You need to change your ways before God for that land to be healed. And that's a scripture to confirm. I will heal them from heaven. I will forgive their sins. And I will heal the land. Let me tell you something. Doesn't matter where you live. You can live here. You can live in South Wales. You can ship to Ethiopia. Russell, you can go to Sierra Leone and live there. But if you go through the four steps that the scripture says today that God commands Solomon to tell the people to do. People around you are poor. You are rich. God will provide your needs. Doesn't matter where you live. As long as you do the will of God. As long as you obey God. As long as you fear God. Doesn't matter where you live. You know, David said, 10,000 people Fall around me, but I'm still standing. You know why? Because he believes and he follows the heart of God. He fears God. He obeys God. Doesn't matter if the world finance is coming down, crashed down. The economy in New Zealand is not that good. It's getting worse. If you stay faithful to God, you're forgiven. He hears your prayers. And he heals your land, your provisions. You get promoted at work, you get a salary rise, 
the others don't get it, you do. Because you belong to God. What did he say? If the people who are called by my name, you're walking around, you're people for Christ, you are for Christ, you're called by the name of the Lord. He said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, will pray, will seek my face, and turn away from their wicked ways, I will hear. See, not all prayers are answered. Only the prayer of the righteous, those who are trying to live for God. God will work on the turn. He will heal your backyard. He will heal your finances. He will heal your physical needs. He will give you peace and joy in your marriage. He gives you directions. He gives you wisdom that nobody else can. If you go through the full steps today of 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Verse 14. If my people who are called by my name. So what is the message for you and me today? First, you need to humble before God. Second, you need to say to him in your words, Lord, I'm sorry for what I've done so far. You need to seek his face through prayers, fasting, go to the Bible study, seek more about God. Go to the men's prayer warriors. Share them about God. And you gain more experience and knowledge of who He is. That's what you go seeking the face of God. Last but not least, you need to turn away from your wicked ways. Why do you want to follow the devil? What did he do for you? Tell me. Can somebody in the house say a full thing that the devil has done to your life? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. He's a liar. He's a thief. The Bible says he comes to deceive you, destroy you, then kill you. I like what Russell said, Phil Gate had a dream, the devil took him to heaven. Who knows Phil Gate? Huh? Looking down, took him down, not up. Phil Gate is that man that invented uh, computers. Took him down to hell. And show him the green grass, beautiful city. What happened next? Then he died and went back to the world. Then he died and he went back to the place that the devil showed him. It's stinking, it's burning. There's no such thing as what he what the devil showed him before. So he asked the devil, where's that place you showed me? This place of hell is nice and beautiful. And what did he say? That was just a demo version. <laughs> the demo version. It's not the real thing. But it was too late. He's in hell. But what about you? How many times the devil deceived you? How many times you put in temptation and you fall onto it? And you get nothing good out of it. And you still do it. That's why the last bit that God said, tell them to turn away from their evil, wicked things. And I will heal you. I will forgive you, he said. And I will heal your land. He's not talking about spiritual things here. He's talking about materialistic things. You'll end up with a nice car, a nice house, a nice family, materialistic things in life. I will heal your provision. Amen. So if you're here today, this is a message for you. Don't miss it. You must be real before God. Humble yourself. Pray the prayer of repentance. Like some people yesterday, they gave their life to Christ. Like that Indian man, Pastor, I need help. What kind of help? Oh, I'm still smoking a lot of water. And, and. So they can't be fixed if you are uh, Willing to be fixed. Or else it's a waste of time. So the formula is given to you today. Second Chronicle chapter 7, verse 14. Humble, pray, seek the face of God. Turn away. The last one is very important. Turn away from wicked ways. You live an unmarried lifestyle? Get married. 
Bible said when you find somebody you love, marry them before God. That's the will of God. If you're not doing your tithing and offering, you are just inviting a devout spirit to attack your finances. And your prayers are not heard. God said, bring first the tithes and offering into the house of the Lord. Then I will open up again. He says, I will open up heaven. But he mentioned the word floodgates. I will open up the floodgates of heaven and pour down the blessings. Some of you are missing out. If you're not being faithful in your tithes and offering to the Lord, heaven's closing up on you. Upon your home, upon your job, upon yourself and your families, because you are not doing what he said to do. He just said to, he just said to Solomon, Solomon just open up, dedicate the temple and say, but sometimes I must shut up heaven. What do you mean by shutting up heaven? That's where the blessing comes from. So if God shut it up, we get nothing. Absolutely nothing. Amen. Then when it comes to the to the to the tithing and offering, if some of you here don't understand what I'm talking about, tithing and offering, tithe speaks a ten percent of your earning. Every week you give that to God. That's not your money. That's not my money. That's God's money. Ten percent of your earning, five hundred dollars you get a week, fifty bucks, that's God. You bring that to church. The offering is five dollars, two dollars, whatever you want to give as an offering from your heart. But the ten percent belongs to him. That's why I said in Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. From verse 8 said, Who can rob God? Who is stealing the money of God? That's what he's talking about. He's talking about the 10%. If you're not giving that 10% to him every Sunday, you're robbing him. Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 said, Who can rob God? The Israelites said, We've been crying at the altar. Help us, but we're not asking it. But he said, Because you are faithful in time and offer. He said, Bring first. The tithes into the house of the Lord. Meaning, when you get paid, the first thing you do is to put away the 10%. That's God's money, 50 bucks, in the envelope, in the shelf. Monday or uh, Sunday, grab it with your offering, $5 or $10, put it in the bag. You know what's going to happen on Sunday and Monday and the rest of the week? Heaven will open upon you. He said, I will open up, verse 10, I will open up the floodgates of heaven. Verse 11. That's the one you wrote, you read this morning. And I will pour down the blessings. Pour down means coming down like a rain. Like you mentioned on this one. I will block the rain in Malachi. I'll open up heaven and I'll pour down the rain. Amen. Try it. I can encourage you to try to be faithful in that 10%. Whatever income you receive, be faithful in that time. And I'll tell you what, God will bless you the rest of the week. Financially, joy, peace in the family, directions of the week, wisdom how to live, all come down. That's what I mean. Pour down the blessings. Go and read it. See Malachi chapter 3. You see the faithfulness of God. Touch an offering or anything of the will of God, when you do it, that means you humble before God. You know, Jesus said to Gethsemane when he was praying, not my will, but what? His will. Not your will, not my will anymore, but His will, whatever He says, He goes. And you see God open heavens. You see God... He can hear your prayers. He will forgive you because nobody's perfect. We always commit a sin. We always do something wrong. So we need forgiveness. So He will forgive our sins and then heal our land. Amen. Amen. If you're sitting here today and you're in that area, you know, don't be ashamed to come up to the altar call because God's going to do something powerful at the altar call today. The presence of the Lord around here is so powerful. 
say, why does pastor have to call me to come in the front? Why can't I just stand up there and get it there? You know why? Because I'm preaching the word from here, not from there. It's coming from here. The anointing is coming from above here. That's why it's called an altar call. You come to the altar. Amen? Amen. You get up and you come to where the presence of the Lord will be. He can come to where you are, but he wants to see how you respond to the word. Do you know what faith means? Faith means that you get up and move forward and believe in God. You get off your seat and say, Lord, I respond to your word. I heard your word. And the first sign of humble you can show to God today is to get off your seat and come in the front and say, here I am, Lord. I need help. Amen. We need to do that. James chapter 4 verse 8. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Come closer to him. He touched you here. Not over there. I will finish with this. My brother, my sister, you need to be smart living this life. Use your head. You want to be blessed? Stay with God. You want to be cursed? Find the devil there. Go with him. Go and burn in hell. Only foolish people will end up there. You smart enough, you end up in heaven. Before you get to heaven, you'll be blessed down here. You get everything that God will pour down. You want God to open up heavens upon your life? Humble. Pray. Seeking God. Turn away from the wicked ways. God will open up heavens. He can heal you. Whatever problems you cry out to, He'll heal you. He'll respond to you. He'll provide for you. He's looking for those who are humble to come before Him and say, I need help. Throw your pride away. You know, a lot of people say, swallow your pride. That's a wrong thing to do. If you swallow your pride, it's still in you. You need to get rid of it. Cough it out. I've told some people, when you say swallow your pride, you're not doing a favor for yourself. How can you swallow your pride? It will stay in you. You need to cough it out. Get rid of it. You don't want God to offend you and finish you off. You want God to love you, to grab you and hug you and bless your life. Don't wait for the song. You do it for yourself. God is touching your hearts today and, and talking to your spirit. Just come to the front.